Uh, welcome, I'm Christy Hartley, and it's my pleasure to moderate this Author Meets Critic session for Blaine Neufeld's Public Reason and Political Autonomy, Realizing the Idea of a Civic People. Dr. Neufeld is Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where he served as chair from 2018 to 2021. His research interests include public reason, citizenship, education, international justice, ideal theory, and the relation between freedom and economic equality. I could not be happier to moderate this session for Blaine. He's a great philosopher. He's my philosophical brother. We share the same philosophy parents, and he is a good friend. It is wonderful to see this book come to fruition, and I can personally attest to the fact that he has been developing some of the ideas in this book since I knew him as a graduate student. We have a great set of critics for this session, including Micah Schwartzman, Chad Van Chalant, and Lori Watson. I will properly introduce each of them before their comments. Our session will go as follows. We'll start with Blaine giving a short synopsis, synopsis of the book, and then each crit critic will have 20 minutes for comments. Blaine will follow with a response, and the floor will be open for questions. So now I turn things over to Blaine. Uh, thanks very much, Christy, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, and yes, uh, you're right. I've been thinking about these um, ideas for over two decades now, since we were in, in uh, graduate school together. Um, I probably have still gotten a lot wrong, but hopefully less wrong than I did uh, uh, 20 years ago. Um, so uh, I'll give a brief overview of the book to start things off. Um, I'll say some things about the it's, uh, the project from a kind of um, high level. And then I'll, I'll go through the, briefly go through the five chapters, uh, mentioning some aspects, uh, ideas in those chapters that are most relevant to our, our discussion um, today. So I've shared a uh, out, uh, outline of the um, uh, paper uh, that I'm gonna give this, the, the overview, I, I assume everyone one can see that. Now, the book begins with this uh, sentence from uh, Rousseau in The Social Contract. He writes, the words subject and sovereign are identical correlatives, the meaning of which is brought together in a single word, citizen. So I see Rousseauian citizens as possessing political autonomy. They are autonomous uh, insofar as uh, the laws are justified to them in, way, in ways that are acceptable to them, and the laws are authorized by them. Now, uh, this this general idea, this Rousseauian notion of political autonomy. I don't want to. I, I don't spend any time talking about Rousseau's own view. That's not really at all the focus of the book. But but I do think that one of the um, driving forces behind political liberalism, certainly my understanding of it, is an attempt to realize this kind of ideal of political autonomy in uh, large pluralistic societies. That it is this ideal still realizable, and if so, uh, once shaped. Uh, should it take? So the, the challenge posed by pluralism, I'm sure this is familiar to, to um, everyone uh, listening, is that in, a, in, in large societies where certain basic rights are respected, such as liberty of conscience and freedom of association, it's un inevitable um, that citizens will come to endorse a variety of different uh, worldviews, uh, what um, Rawls and other political liberals typically call comprehensive doctrines. So some citizens will be Buddhists, others will uh, be utilitarians, um, others will be Catholics and so forth. And that the only way to uh, prevent this, at least according to political liberalism, is through the use of uh, coercive oppressive power. And so there, there's a question here of how can we um, respect the principle of toleration while still um, realizing a kind of political autonomy? You might think that these are incompatible, that um, that you can either have one, you can either have a tolerant society in which people uh, can adhere to a wide variety of different worldviews, or you can have one in which um, laws are justifiable to everyone in that society, but that would seem to require a, a high degree of homogeneity in the views of citizens. While political liberalism uh, tries, at least as I interpret it, tries to get around this uh, um, problem by, by providing a, an account of uh, political autonomy uh, that enables all citizens to be equal co-sovereigns, broadly speaking, 
while nonetheless accommodating uh, diversity. So citizens, according to this view, um, can be politically autonomous. They enjoy roughly equal political power, but if they also uh, justify the exercise of that power with public reasons. And the ideal of public reason, which is an ideal that is realized through the use of public reasons when justifying decisions concerning fundamental political matters, um, purports thus to harm harmonize the liberal principle of liberal toleration with a robust ideal of democratic self-government, namely the equal political autonomy of citizens. And so in the book, I propose that the, this ideal of uh, equal political autonomy uh, best justifies the idea of public reason. And I call this account, especially the, the um, I especially focus on the idea of shared political autonomy, and I call this account the civic people account of political liberalism. So within a civic people, citizens are uh, equal um, participants, equal sovereigns, but also subjects. Uh, and this is achievable even within societies characterized by uh, plural, plural, pluralism. So my overarching aim in the book is to show that the ideal of a civic people is one that uh, we, the citizens of uh, non-ideal societies, uh, limited, uh, flawed uh, liberal democratic societies should attempt to realize at least as best we can in our shared political practices and institutions. So I'll just go uh, in terms of the chapters, five chapters in the book, uh, the first three roughly are, um, what one might be called the, um, present the theory um, uh, that I defend. And then the last two are sort of, uh, are more applied in nature. So the first chapter is um, uh, largely a, an explanatory chapter. It goes through a lot of the main elements of political liberalism. I won't bore, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure most people here are familiar with the main elements of uh, Rawlsian political liber liberalism. So I won't go through them right now, but I'll note a couple of uh, distinctive features of my take on uh, political liberalism um, that, I that I discuss in this chapter. So obviously the idea of political autonomy is very important to my um, overall argument. And, uh, and so in the first chapter, I, I sort of explain what I mean by full political autonomy. Full political autonomy uh, has three elements, institutional autonomy, so this requires robust democratic institutions and rights. Justificatory autonomy. Uh, this form of autonomy is realized when fundamental political decisions are decided uh, via public reasons. And uh, shared autonomy, which involves citizens making decisions together as uh, free and equal members of society using public reasons. Um, another element um, or uh, feature um, of my view of political liberalism that might, might differ from some uh, from Rawls's and, and standard others accounts is this idea of a political uh, li uh, liberal well-ordered society. And this I uh, should uh, note is an idea that I developed with Laurie Watson. So I, um, I only get, should get half the blame uh, for it. Uh, so this, this idea of a political liberal well-ordered society is a revision to the, the account of the well-ordered society in, in Rawls and that it tries to accommodate um, the existence of a family of reasonable political conceptions of justice. So in this kind of well-ordered society, all citizens endorse a reasonable political conception of justice. The basic structure is organized in compliance with um, a, at least one reasonable political uh, conception of justice, although there might be a mix um, over time that come to be um, instantiated in the basic structure. Citizens know this, uh, so there's publicity about all, 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 all of this, and a public political culture obtains in which there's a reasonable overlapping consensus on this family of reasonable political conceptions of justice and citizens share a commitment to public reasoning. So key to understanding this idea, I think, is a distinction between um, citizens finding a conception of justice reasonable and acceptable and citizens endorsing a particular conception of justice. So all reasonable political conceptions of justice are at least acceptable to reasonable citizens because they um, respect citizens, uh, say fundamental interests, uh, treat them as equals and so forth. But mo most citizens I assume will endorse at most one particular conception of justice. So there's a family of conceptions that are all acceptable to reasonable citizens, but there's usually only one that, that uh, any particular citizen will in fact uh, endorse. Um, so those are sort of two ideas I, uh, that, that I think, I think are um, 
uh, important for my account and, and maybe not um, uh, that differ from sort of the standard view of, of political liberalism. Chapter two, uh, I know I'm, uh, I only have a few more minutes to go through the overview, but I, I um, let me just say something about chapter two because it's sort of a, a, an important um, in terms of the theory uh, that I defend in that, uh, so I, I start with this um, quote from Rawls, public reason is the form of reasoning appropriate to citizens who as a corporate body impose rules on one another by sanctions of state power. So I try to make sense of this idea by drawing upon Michael Bratman's theory of shared intentions. Um, and this, this I, drawing on this account, I developed this idea of uh, shared political autonomy. And the idea is that a civic people is a shared political, politically autonomous agent in a sense, because all the citizens within that society, at least all the reasonable citizens share a policy, which is an ongoing shared intention to decide fundamental political questions by means of public reasons. And I, I won't get into the details of that account here, um, but I do I, I contrast this account with two, two rivals, what I call the constrained proceduralist account, which um, also can be, can be formulated, it doesn't have to be, but it can be formulated as a kind of shared commitment um, that is a, say a Bratmanian shared policy to adhere to sort of um, the fair democratic procedures but it doesn't require that the political decisions be justified in any particular way. And I also discussed the convergence account of public justification uh, defended uh, in recent years by Gerald Gauss and Kevin Vallier and others. Um, and both of these alternatives, I try to argue, cannot realize the ideal of uh, full political autonomy. And so if we are committed to this kind of ideal, then the civic people um, I, uh, account is the way to go. And I conclude the chapter, um, I say a few other things in the chapter, of course, but I, I conclude it by defending a, what I call a, a, a conception-based account um, of, of the idea of public reason. So here I'm drawing a lot on, on Paul Weithman's excellent book, the, um, Why Political Liberalism, although I'm modifying in various ways. But what I like about Weithman's view is that he puts forward this, what, what he calls an ideal-based or conception-based uh, account of um, the justification of, of pol political liberalism. And in my variation of it, the ideal or conception is this ideal of politically autonomous citizens. And the argument is that if you endorse this ideal, say in reflective equilibria, uh, citizens will, various things fall from it, a duty to justify uh, fundamental political decisions in terms of public reasons and, and, and so forth, to interact with others on the basis of civic respect. Um, so, and this is contrasted with with uh, respect a uh, respect based view, which which is a view I, I held in the past um, and and defended, um, but which I, I I now, after years of thinking about this, have come to think as is has suffered some certain problems, that the conception based uh, does not. And so, but why why adopt this ideal of political autonomy? Well, I I, I give a few reasons. Um, one might be that on reflection we find that citizens of Liberal democratic societies are, are, are committed to it uh, already, given their other commitments. But even if they're not, they might see that um, political autonomy realizes certain important political goods, such as it avoids alienation, uh, domination, and it enables uh, citizens to enjoy relations of civic friendship with one another, despite the fact that they endorse different comprehensive doctrines. Now, I'm just going to spend one minute or two just quickly going through the other chapters. So in chapter three, I look at the relation between public reasoning and ideal theory. And I kind of defend a view uh, that is a bit different than the standard account. So the standard account holds that you start with ideal theory, and then you develop a conception of justice, and then you draw on that in public reasoning. I suggest, I have no, I have no problem with that view, but I suggest that a commitment to public reasoning um, can lead to ideal theory, even if we don't want to be ideal theorists. That is, even if we are concerned only with only focusing on addressing injustices in front of us, particular injustices, but we think that we should use public reasoning to do so, there's going to be kind of pressure within, given the structure and nature of public reason, to move towards some level of ideal theorizing. Maybe not full-blown ideal theorizing, but there, but there is that a, a certain kind of pressure in that direction. Um, in chapter four, I look I discuss the idea of the basic structure, and I apply, I develop a certain account of it which I apply to questions concerning uh, uh, gender equality and, and the parent-child uh, relations. Um, I argue that the basic structure should be reformulated uh, to, to apply, to include aspects of institutions, 
um, and, the, and should apply to any aspects of any institutions that, that concern the free and equal status of citizens. So aspects of, of households should be part of the basic structure, not, not households altogether though, other, other aspects shouldn't be. And this account I think also can help delineate the scope of parents' authorities with respect to children. All right, so I just, I'll jump ahead to the, since I'm over time to chapter five, where I talk about education and I outline the requirements of a, um, a civic citizenship education for political autonomy. And I argue that those requirements actually would realize um, uh, the uh, a conception of uh, non-domination or Republican freedom, at least the, the account formulated by Philip Pettit. So the argument in that, uh, in the second half of that chapter is roughly that if, if you're committed to political liberalism and, and, and an education for political autonomy, you get, uh, uh, you realize uh, non-domination automatically. So that is you get everything you, in, in terms of uh, Republican freedom uh, from uh, political autonomy understood in a political liberal way. And so, it, so, and so Republican, Republicanism and Republican freedom really isn't a, an alternative to political liberalism is already uh, contained within it. All right, so sorry for going over time. I'll, I'll stop talking now. Thank you. Uh, our first critic is Micah Schwartzman, who is the director of the Karsh Center for Law and Democracy and the Hardy Croft Dillard Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. His scholarship focuses on law and religion, jurisprudence, political philosophy, and constitutional law. And he co-edited The Rise of Corporate Religious Liberty and is co-authoring a forthcoming casebook on constitutional law and religion. Thanks, Christy, and thanks to uh, Blaine for uh, including me uh, in this discussion of his um, excellent book. Uh, in these um, remarks on, uh, on Blaine's book, I want to focus uh, on the role that intentions and motivations play in his account of public reason. And there are a couple um, questions or sets of questions uh, that I, uh, I want to raise. Um, so one, one set of questions Go something like this. Uh, we could ask, are citizens and officials uh, required to be um, motivated um, by uh, public reasons when they engage in the exercise of uh, political power? Um, another way to put the question is to ask, must laws be motivated by um, public reason? And if so, what exactly does it mean to be motivated in that way? A second set of questions asks uh, whether specific laws um, um, you know, if, even if specific laws have to be motivated by public reasons, it would ask whether the intentions or motivations of citizens are relevant at some more foundational level uh, to the idea of political autonomy. And if the exercise of political power is legitimate only when it's consistent with political autonomy, then is our account of legitimacy sensitive in some way to intentions uh, and motivations? Um, I'm focused on these questions for two reasons. Um, the first is that I find actually very little to disagree with in Blaine's account of public reason. I might have some minor disagreements on questions about the scope of public reason, whether it applies only to the matters of basic justice and constitutional essentials or to a broader class of activities within the basic structure, um, or maybe about some of the political or policy implications of his view. But by and large, I'm quite sympathetic to his reconstruction of public reason as justified by a conception-based view that incorporates uh, his understanding of civic respect. Um, so my, my second reason for focusing uh, on intentions and motivations is that I think that accounts of public reason and legitimacy um, are not well explored or understood in this regard. That is, we don't have a lot of work on the relationship between the intentions of citizens and other civic actors uh, and concepts uh, like legitimacy. Uh, and Blaine's account raises questions about those relationships, I think more clearly than, uh, than some others. So my comments are meant to be exploratory uh, more than critical. I think Blaine is right or mostly right to make intentions uh, and motivations matter in his account. And I wanna try to highlight um, how that makes his account distinctive as compared to some of the others he discusses, uh, especially the constrained proceduralist account and the convergence theories of public justification. Um, let me take my two questions in order. The first is the narrower question of whether laws must be motivated by public reasons. That is, must citizens or officials, those responsible for engaging in the use of political power, must they have intentions or motivations based on public reasons uh, when they act? 
As I understand Blaine's civic people account, if citizens are committed to giving others public justifications, that commitment entails being motivated by public reasons. Um, in his argument about why public reason requires local ideal theorizing, Blaine says that what it means to give a successful public justification is to give a reason that will motivate compliance. And that's a natural way, I think, to understand having and offering others uh, reasons that justify a law. If the reason's not sufficient to motivate compliance, whether your own or that of other people, that suggests the reason isn't in fact justificatory. That a reason motivates is we might think good evidence that those who hold it believe it is justificatory. And so when citizens offer public reasons for laws, they, shouldn't be they should be motivated by those reasons. If they aren't motivated, then we might worry that those laws are not in fact justified. There is, I think, a problem with this account of motivating reasons, and that's linked to the structure of public justification within political liberalism more generally. Um, within political liberalism, citizens are assumed to have comprehensive conceptions of the good, and those conceptions may provide them with reasons that motivate them, which we might call motivational reasons. Um, now, reasonable citizens uh, will have comprehensive motivational reasons for acting according to the demands of public reason. They will comply with the duty of civility which they take to require offering public reasons that others can reasonably accept. But now we can ask, are they motivated by those public reasons? And here a reasonable citizen might reply, and this is just, this is what I've imagined a reasonable citizen might say, might go something like this. Uh, a reasonable citizen might say, I have deeper comprehensive reasons for my actions that provide my ultimate motivations. I'm motivated to offer others public reasons and to comply with the law. But in a strict sense, public reasons don't motivate my compliance. My motivation comes from what Rawls calls my full justification in which my commitment to public reason is justified by my comprehensive doctrine. But it's that doctrine that provides my motivations. Public reasons only have force for me because they're connected in reflective equilibrium with my other reasons, that is my comprehensive reasons, which are my ultimate sources of motivation. Now, we can ask how should someone committed to the common people account of public reason respond to that sort of, uh, of reply, or maybe it's an objection. One answer might be to weaken the motivational requirement. We could say, instead of saying that public reasons are successful only when they actually motivate compliance, um, we could adopt a weaker requirement of hypothetical motivation. If one didn't have a deeper or comprehensive reason that provides motivation, the public reasons would be sufficient to motivate compliance. Given the possibility of a weaker requirement of this kind, and that uh, for any given citizen, pro tanto public reasons will be embedded within their full justifications, it might be too demanding to say that public reasons must be self-motivating. It might be sufficient uh, if those reasons would justify compliance absent other comprehensive or non-public uh, reasons that might independently or over-determine a citizen's motivation. Political liberalism is consistent with a diversity of motivating reasons. And I think the common people account can be amended or modified to accommodate a more complex or perhaps subtler account of how public reasons and non-public reasons might motivate both the exercise of political power and compliance with it. So I think this addresses the, the first type of question I wanted to ask about the relationship between motivations and public reason. Do, do uh, exercises of political power have to be motivated by public reason. And I think it's natural for those um, offering public reason accounts to suggest a positive answer to that question that yes, citizens have to be motivated, but there might be uh, various more complex structures in our underlying reasons which, uh, which should complicate that picture. Let me turn now to a, a second question. Suppose citizens don't have to be motivated by public reason or that there's some kind of hypothetical motivation requirement. Um, we might still think that the idea of political autonomy requires that they be motivated by a commitment to engaging in public reason. Um, as Blaine says in his book, uh, a commitment on the part of reasonable citizens to employ public reasons when deciding fundamental policy matters can be understood as a shared policy. A civic people is formed, now I'm speaking in my own words, a civic people is formed when citizens have a shared intention to abide by the demands of public reason, at least when it comes to determining constitutional essentials and matters of basic justice. In Blaine's account, political power is legitimate when citizens have the necessary intentions to form a shared policy of engaging in public reason. This account of legitimacy is what I'm gonna call intention sensitive. 
it depends on citizens having the right sorts of intentions or motivations. And I'm not distinguishing in any sharp way here between intentions and motivations. And I realize there are various sophisticated ways of describing those concepts, but here I'll just group them together. Um, notice, however, that um, the two accounts that Blaine contrasts with his own and rejects, the constrained proceduralist account and convergence uh, conceptions of public justification, those accounts are not sensitive to intentions, or at least not uh, in the way that Blaine's is. First, consider the constrained proceduralist account, which holds that the exercise of power is legitimate when a constitutional order respects the equal status of all citizens, and when it effectively guarantees each citizen the basic liberal rights and entitlements necessary to participate in political processes on equal terms. Those descriptions come from an account given by Simon May. Blaine interprets this account as citizens, quote, sharing a policy to A, decide fundamental political questions via fair democratic procedures, and B, um, ensure that such procedures and decisions respect the equal liber liberal um, democratic rights of all citizens, unquote. But strictly speaking, I think that uh, the constrained proceduralist uh, account um, may not require that citizens have particular intentions or share a policy with these kinds of commitments. A version of this procedural account uh, might be made intention sensitive uh, uh, in this way, but a more minimal account might um, simply require a set of political institutions that functions effectively according to the moral constraints set forth by that account. That is, without citizens having any underlying uh, shared policy. Of course, we might think that no set of institutions will be stable in the practical or political sense for the wrong reasons in, in Rawls's way of thinking, um, unless citizens uh, or enough citizens form the relevant intentions to sustain them. But that concern only provides a reason um, to make an account of legitimacy sensitive to citizens' intentions as a matter of contingent or empirical political stability. It's a weak basis for incorporating uh, intentions or motivations. The same is true, I think, for convergence conceptions of public justification. They're also intention insensitive, or to borrow a phrase from Matthias Brinkman, uh, we, could, we could label um, such views as political anti-intentionalism or anti-intentionalist. In other words, the intentions, motivations of officials and citizens are morally irrelevant when determining whether a law or some exercise of political power is legitimate. What matters is that proposals for collective action are the result of, quote, properly designed constitutional structures, unquote. Like uh, May's proceduralist view, the convergence conception is a kind of institutionalism or proceduralism. Laws are legitimate when they're the product of some justified procedure or institution. And whether procedures are justified doesn't turn on citizens' intentions or motivations, but only on whether those procedures generally yield outcomes that can be justified to the relevant political constituency, members of the public or reasonable people or so on. Suppose you agree with me that there is a distinction between Blaine's civic people account on the one hand and the, uh, the constrained uh, proceduralist account and the convergence conception on the other. Blaine's view is intention sensitive. It makes legitimacy depend on whether citizens have the right sort of intentions, but the constrained account and the convergence conceptions um, don't. Legitimacy under those views doesn't depend on citizens' intentions, only on whether the state action follows from the right sorts of procedures or institutions. At this point, you might be asking, what difference does it make whether a theory of legitimacy is sensitive to intentions? And here, I think there are several answers, some of which Blaine anticipates, and one I want to mention that I think he doesn't quite. Um, Intention-sensitive theories of legitimacy tend to attract several, three types of objections, what I'll call ontological, epistemic, and moral. The ontological or metaphysical objection is that relevant intentions simply don't exist. This can be a problem for collective agents, especially on a mass scale, where it can be a challenge to explain how collective, shared, or corporate intentions are possible. And Blaine answers this problem by relying on Bratman's uh, theory of shared intentions and by noting various ways of scaling up that theory. Next, the epistemic objection says, like, even if it's possible to have collective or shared intentions, how is it possible to know them? That can be uh, a really difficult thing. How do we know that citizens acted on the basis of uh, the right intentions um, when they're engaged uh, in public reasoning. And again, Blaine has some answers. We can look at the outcomes of political decisions, of elections, 
And we can maybe also take some measure of the quality of public discourse to determine whether there's general compliance with a duty of civility, that is with uh, the demands of public reason. That leaves a third objection, which isn't, as I understand it, ontological or epistemic, but rather moral. Um, in recent years, some philosophers and legal scholars, most notably uh, Tim Scanlon, Judith Jarvis Thompson, uh, Dick Fallon, and Deborah Hellman, these scholars have argued that intentions are never directly relevant to the moral permissibility of our actions, including our collective exercises of political power. If you think about legitimacy as setting conditions for the permissibility of political action, that is, as an account of moral permissibility at the political level, this kind of objection, what I call the permissibility objection, seems like a problem. It suggests that intentions are never directly relevant to whether uh, moral conduct is permissible. If you think of legitimacy as an account of permissible conduct, and I realize there's a lot of possible argument uh, and room, room for uh, drawing these sorts of connections, but if, you, if you're willing to make that conceptual leap, um, then you might think that this kind of permissibility objection poses a, a problem uh, for a theory of legitimacy that incorporates uh, intentions in the way that Blaine's does. Um, if, uh, if a theory is of legitimacy is intention uh, sensitive, then it might seem to invite this kind of objection that when we're evaluating whether uh, various forms of conduct are permissible, uh, the intentions of the people who engage in it simply aren't relevant to the permissibility of that conduct. I, don't, I won't lay out the argument for that permissibility objection here. Uh, it may, maybe it's familiar uh, from, the, from the philosophical literature on uh, blame and moral permissibility. But anyway, I wanna flag that uh, there's a possible concern for intention sensitive accounts of legitimacy here that I think, again, is not, is not well explored um, in the existing literature. Um, some political liberals might be inclined to respond to this sort of objection by drawing a fairly sharp distinction between justifications and intentions or motivations. What matters uh, in the law uh, is about whether uh, the, the exercise of political power is justified um, and not the intentions or motivations for it. On this view, justifications about whether there are good reasons for the exercise of political power, whether laws have uh, or are supported by good reasons, I mean, it doesn't matter whether people intended or were motivated by those reasons or whether the laws were enacted on the basis of them. Um, of course, people who aim to give public justifications might do a better job of it, um, but maybe not. And if procedures or institutions produce justified outcomes, even when citizens don't aim at those outcomes, then someone here might say, so be it. Under a view like this, what matters are the reasons that justify laws, not the reasons for which motivated uh, uh, officials that motivated officials or the citizens uh, who adopted those laws. That's one kind of story that you can tell uh, here that what we really care about is the reasons, the justifications, we don't care about intentions and motivations. But I think Blaine's civic people account is more demanding than that. Um, that is, uh, for him, the intentions of citizens and officials are part of the story. Um, that's because what it means to respect others and to promote their and our own autonomy depends on our attitudes and intentions toward them. The ideas of civic respect and civic friendship are thoroughly intentional. That aspect of those ideas is I think a deep feature of the civic people account and one that separates it from procedural and convergence competitors. This makes the civic people account richer in my view, but it also invites this objection, which I think deserves more attention um, as does uh, the role of intentions and motivations in thinking about theories of political legitimacy more generally. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next critic is Chad Vanchalant, who is chair of the Department of Philosophy at Tulane University, where he's also an associate professor. His work is primarily in social and political philosophy, particularly in public reason and social contract traditions, and at the intersection of philosophy, politics, and economics. He co-edited the Rutledge Handbook of Anarchy and Anarchist Thought. Chad. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to focus on Blaine's concept of political, liberal, well-ordered society. I will acknowledge at the out front, as Blaine did, that this is an idea that he um, 
generated originally with Lori Watson, but I want to make clear all blame I have is directed only at Blaine, and um, but half the credit definitely goes to Lori. Um, so in order to get a handle on the political liberal well-ordered society, I think it is worth noting what Rawls's original well-ordered society was, which Blaine does discuss in the book. The rough sketches in a well-ordered society, all the citizens or all the reasonable citizens, everyone in the society endorses the same conception of justice. The society conforms to that conception of justice. People know these two facts. It's not surprising to them. And I think we can assume that these are not just like happenstance. It's causal. It's the society conforms to it because the people hold it that they democratically shape the society to conform with the um, conception of justice that they all share. And there's various reasons that you might want to think about a well-ordered society. Blaine notes three in the book. Um, one is that people might use uh, uh, the, the idea of a well-ordered society, provide citizens with an exemplar for thinking critically about our own society. So we might use it critically to say, well, that's what a fully just society would look like. Ours falls short in, in whatever ways. Uh, the idea of a well-ordered society provides citizens with a target or goal for political reform. And it plays a role in helping citizens evaluate different conceptions of justice by, by enabling them to compare societies fully well-ordered by those conceptions. So if we're comparing um, utilitarianism to justice as fairness, we think of a well-ordered utilitarian society where everyone endorsed it and then tried to uh, have their, their institutions conform to utilitarianism, likewise with justice as fairness. Um, I'll add uh, at least a fourth that for Rawls, it seems to play an important role that of thinking about the stability of a conception of justice, that Rawls was very interested in whether if a society came to satisfy the conception and people did endorse it, would they continue to in an ongoing basis? Or instead, would it tend to um, be unstable if there were any shocks to the system? Would people come to reject it? Would they find it too demanding or the like? So we want to know, is it stable at least if you get to it? Um, as Blaine noted in his introductory remarks, one of the important things for all of these discussions is the sort of fact of reasonable pluralism. Uh, this was originally thought to be, apply to conceptions of the good or why we have religious disagreements of the sorts that Blaine indicated. Um, these all emerge from what Rawls called the burdens of judgment. So people under free institutions, they're going to interpret vague concepts differently, they might weigh things differently, their whole life experience informs or affects how they interpret, and so they come to different conceptions of the good. Rawls came to hold that the same applies to conceptions of justice, that what you end up with is in thinking about what it means to be a free and equal citizen, um, what it means to have a society that's fair terms of cooperation over time, people, reasonable people thinking sincerely are going to often have, have different interpretations of these and ultimately form different conceptions of justice. So Rawls shifted from thinking you could have a well-ordered society based on one conception of justice to thinking maybe people would all agree to each hold one member of a family of liberal views. Um, this gets to where Blaine's concept of a political liberal well-ordered society comes in. It's thinking, okay, how can we still have a, a well-ordered society despite everyone not endorsing the same conception? You get the, as Blaine laid out, the claim is everyone endorses, each person endorses A, conception. Uh, that's a reasonable political conception of justice. Each person in, is endorsing a member of the family of liberal views. Um, 
And he says, the basic structure is organized in compliance with a reasonable political conception of justice, that at least one of them is actually being conformed to. Uh, all citizens know these, and a, politic, a public political culture obtains as characterized by a reasonable overlapping consensus on the family of reasonable political conceptions and a shared commitment to public reason. Um, and as Blaine noted, the way that they see the conceptions that they don't endorse is they still find them mutually acceptable. So it's supposed to be well ordered in that it does conform to a reasonable conception of justice that everyone sees as acceptable, though they might think some other conception would be even better. In trying to think about how this functions to replace Rawls's original conception of a well-ordered society, the, one of the things that's unclear to me is how much disagreement there would actually be here. And I think there's one way to understand the pluralism about justice that makes the political, liberal, well-ordered society easy is if it turns out the pluralism is very minimal. And I do suspect that this is something of uh, Blaine's view. He says, for instance, uh, he argues that the principles of those conceptions, the different ones in the society, are at least acceptable to all reasonable citizens, even if they endorse somewhat different conceptions. Not um, much that I'd want to make out of that, but somewhat different implies not very, maybe not, not particularly significantly different. Um, there are other places where Blaine is a little bit clearer that he thinks that there's going to be substantial overlap. So he says, it may be that different reasonable political conceptions of justice overlap in justifying the same kinds of institutions within the basic structure. This is especially likely with respect to constitutional essentials. He, uh, Blaine also proposes that there would be considerable overlap within the family of reasonable political conceptions of justice on constitutional essentials, specifically the set of basic rights and liberties necessary for free and equal citizenship and the special priority assigned to those rights and liberties. So here we see there's sort of a commitment to, yeah, 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 there, people have different views, but maybe at least the first principle of justice is fairness is like, yeah, they just all, all have that. They all overlap, they all agree on what the constitution should be enshrining in terms of rights. Anything else is um, lower level, and there's a question about how how much difference there is. I see sort of two ways that the differences might not make a difference. Um, to put it in sort of a um, little bit of a caricature, but if it's if the differences about everything else, where it's not a perfect overlap, are small and insignificant, and if there's not very many of them, if for instance it turned out there were four. The, the family of liberal views had four members, justice is fairness, um, justice is fairness, but replace the difference principle with constrained utilitarianism. So a minimum and then maximize uh, average income. And then uh, one or two variants on the difference principle. One that say levels down in cases where you had two policies that did equally well for the worse off. One says, let the rich be even richer. The other says, no, no, cut them down. Um, if this was so, then you then I know what a political liberal well ordered society is doing for us. That it's you expect that it could in fact be guided by a conception that's reasonable to think. If there were only four, probably one of them would hold, and the others aren't that different anyways. So by conforming to one, it mostly conforms to the others. Maybe even if people were to change their views and cycle among these, you're not getting major institutional changes. We'd then be able to maybe think, do those things that Blaine highlighted, a well-ordered society is meant to be for. We can compare conceptions this way. Say, you know, if we had this somewhat the utilitarian, the constrained utilitarian version or the difference principle, compare well-ordered societies that way, knowing that each of them would have dissenters. Another way that it, I'd at least know how we're thinking it through is if, um, it turned out, which I 
Blaine might think that even though there's disagreement, you can still expect most of society to converge on something. And so this would be um, something of a fact of reasonable minority dissent, where in a well-ordered society, you might think maybe everyone endorses, maybe just about everyone endorses justice's fairness, but there's always gonna be some reasonable people who hold some different view. Maybe they're not politically influential. Maybe there's not enough of them. Maybe they don't agree among themselves. And so the society is just sort of driven by the majority who hold justice as fairness. And they just keep holding justice as fairness. They just, you know, changes happen. People dissent, no big deal. And then it still looks almost exactly like Rawls' well ordered society, just with a note that, and some reasonable people are dissenters. They, they say it's acceptable, but they kind of wish it was something different. Not too much of a concern about the pluralism, at least in part, because there's not too much of it. People aren't going all different directions. There's a few places they go. Most, most people go the same way. That's one way that we might be thinking of how the, the pluralism manifests and then what a political liberal well-ordered society does. That would also, I think, explain why Blaine doesn't in the book have too much work emphasizing like what differences come from the shift from well-ordered society to political well-ordered society. There's a shift in concept, but I don't really see much downstream that like, and then we have to revise this in light of those changes um, outside of the, the revision to the concept of political autonomy, which goes from them get being autonomous from endorsement to them being autonomous from the acceptability. There's small shift, but not really much needs to change in light of the change to a political liberal well-ordered society, that ideal. Um, now there's a possibility that the differences are not so minimal, not so constrained, and will actually make a difference. Um, Rawls, when uh, talking about the features of a, pol a liberal political conception says, these elements can be understood in different ways so that there are many variant liberalisms. People might have different ideas about which liberties are basic, they might have different ideas about the extent of these liberties, how best to interpret them. Anytime we start talking about the special priority, well, that's vague. They might, some play, some might say lexical priority. Others might say, yeah, it's very weighty. How they make trade-offs or under what conditions they would can vary. Um, the nature of a social minimum, what sort of minimal resources uh, citizens need in order to effectively exercise these rights. People can disagree about what kinds of resources, how much. Um, so you should at least expect a range there and then what to do with anything else beyond that. Um, Blaine seems to agree. He says, uh, there may be some important disagreements among different reasonable political conceptions of justice over how best to interpret these rights and liberties as well as perhaps some debate over how to rank them. So even when we're talking about the constitutional essentials, even when we're talking about the basic liberties themselves, people might disagree about, well, what exactly does freedom of association include or not include, and how does freedom of association weigh against other, other rights or concerns? Um, so we can have disagreement even at that level. Um, Blaine recognizes disagreement sort of in the in the general ideas in the at the abstract level says reasonable political conceptions may differ in how they interpret the ideas of uh, citizens as free and equal persons and the a society as a fair system of social cooperation over time these differences may be explained at least in part by different interpretations about how best to satisfy the criterion of reciprocity so we get even at these um, abstract levels, criteria of reciprocity, understanding of citizens is free and equal, different interpretations. Um, there's even more disagreement gets introduced when Neufeld turns to uh, thinking of other than things other than the basic liberties. So Blaine notes the possibility of wide-ranging disagreements on matters of non-constitutional basic justice, such as with respect to principles of distributive justice. And I think it's 
pretty easy to um, see how the, these areas can become uh, very, have very extensive disagreements. Um, even people in the literature who, who think in terms of an original position to clarify these ideas, we see that there's lots of disagreement about exactly how to characterize an original position, characterize the agents in that position, how their reasoning should go, and that even small changes, changing which principle of choice is used by the agents can lead to very big differences in the principles ultimately selected. Um, this includes in the literature people who argue that utilitarianism would be selected or uh, requirements from the original position that socialism be uh, selected or libertarianism with a social minimum. Uh, Blaine has some uh, remarks about um, libertarianism not being included, but at least that some of the versions in the literature just like tack in a qualification of social minimum, um, which would answer that concern. Um, more or less extensive versions of different rights, different thresholds, different ways of trading off all appear in the literature. There's also multiplication of which goods are included. Uh, we see that in the existing literature, there's disagreement about which goods are primary goods. Does it include leisure? is one of the things in the literature. Does it include caring relationships or the social bases of caring relationships is another thing. If you include those or exclude them, that produces significantly different conceptions of justice that I would anticipate have significantly different policy implications that different institutions might be justified depending on whether the conception includes these. And then of course, how they're said to be distributed. Is it utilitarianism over leisure or is it uh, a, a social minimum of leisure or is it some indexing of leisure against other things or the like? Um, the Another source came out in uh, even Blaine's discussion at the beginning that if we're thinking about which aspects of institutions are part of the basic structure at all, it looks like there could probably be reasonable disagreement there. And there's going to be large scale disagreement, I would anticipate, um, when it comes to actually applying any of the principles. That as a matter of applying them to empirical circumstances, people disagree even when they agree in principle. We can see this with discussions about what the difference principle implies about property rights. Some people might think it implies laissez-faire. Some people might think it implies socialism. Some people might think it implies any number of other um, policies with regard to property rights in order to maximize the well-being of the least well off. So even agreeing on the principle, they can disagree in practice on what that means. So, um, this would start to make the political liberal well-ordered society appear to be one in which there's wide ranging disagreements about which principles to endorse and wide ranging disagreements about what they imply. Um, I'll note one additional thing that Blaine recognized in a footnote, he says, um, different reasonable political conceptions of justice may, through society's democratic decisions over time, come to shape various other institutions and laws, like education and um, policies. The latter possibility means that different parts of a society's basic structure may come to be shaped by different reasonable political conceptions of justice rather than a single conception. And here I, I've become very unclear on how to understand what a political liberal well-ordered society is because its original specification was that the society, which I take to mean the, the basic structure, conforms to a conception of justice. But if this is right, we have wide ranging views about justice and including their implications, including maybe what's even part of the basic structure, in actual churning of political events, different people get different laws passed. Maybe the utilitarians were able to get their education policy passed. Maybe the, um, the justices fairness people were able to get their family policy passed or whatever. Uh, maybe the, the um, libertarian-ish people got their their 
claims over international policy and immigration. So what we don't then have in this kind of case is society satisfying the, the specified condition. Now you do, you might still have any given sector complies with some reasonable conception. Maybe people find that acceptable. But what you don't have is the society as a whole doing it. Even if at a given time, you were able to get the society as a whole to satisfy. If the justice is fairness folk got enough political sway that they were able to sweep across policies, I think what Blaine points to here is you shouldn't expect that to be stable. What you should expect is over time, those policies are going to be changed by people, by those dissenters, by people with different competing views to move them off of the society fully satisfying justice as fairness or any other conception of justice. So what you should expect is some sort of blended, mixed, um, or hybrid society from a wide range of conflicting views. I'll, and I think I can close in a minute. I'll just note returning to what a, a the idea of a well-ordered society was originally supposed to do for us and to consider whether this sort of highly diverse or highly pluralistic about justice, society could do that. Um, Blaine indicates that, that the idea of a well-ordered society provides citizens with an exemplar for thinking critically about our own society. I'm less clear how it would do that if we have a bunch of different sectors regulated by different conceptions and there, it's not a stable thing that those could be switched around. What we might get perhaps is if no politically liberal well-ordered society would have a certain policy and we do, that might be a basis for criticism. But um, this, the pluralism seems to reduce, I would think, the critical leverage. Um, provides a goal for political reform. Um, less clear to me how um, when you have this uh, hybridized, highly pluralistic society, it's providing a target. Um, and that it plays a role in helping citizens evaluate different conceptions. I, I, I lose handle on how it does that at all if we know that every society is gonna just have a wide range of them where varying degrees of endorsement and varying sectors that they have sway in. Then it's not clear to me how I'm comparing utilitarianism to justice as fairness to whatever other of the competitors if in all of them, they're pluralistic and hodgepodgey. And lastly, with regard to Rawls's own thoughts on stability, I think this would show that necessarily all of them are unstable, that that would just be the, the upshot, that when we think about them in terms of the political, liberal, well-ordered society, we should not expect any society if it had, even if it gained full um, coherence, with a single conception. You shouldn't expect it to hold over time because the burdens of judgment will lead there to be dissent and the normal democratic process is going to lead people to change some of the laws to shift it toward their alternative reasonable conceptions. But all that is just to uh, invite Blaine to clarify for me how, um, how the political liberal well-ordered society is meant to function and serve those roles, or maybe it doesn't serve those roles, and it might depend on how much pluralism about justice he thinks there really will be. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, we have Lori Watson, who is Professor of Philosophy at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research focuses on topics in political philosophy, feminism, the philosophy of law and ethics, She's the author of A Concise Introduction to Logic with Patrick Hurley, Equal Citizenship and Public Reason with me, Debating Pornography with Andrew Altman, and Debating Sex Work with Jessica Flanagan. And she is a co-editor of the forthcoming The Rutledge Handbook of the Philosophy of Sex. Hi, thank you, Christy. Uh, and thank you, Blaine, for including me. I appreciated both Micah's and Chad's comments. A lot to think about, because I agree with Blaine so much. So now my wheels are turning of, how to answer uh, your questions and concerns. And I'm eager to hear what, what Blaine thinks. Um, <clears throat> so let me begin then just by saying, Blaine, I loved your book. It's a wonderful book. Um, I enjoyed it and I think it makes an important contribution to the literature on political liberalism. 
and it walks the reader through many nuanced debates to render a compelling interpretation and defense of political realism. So I'm a fan. Um, I'm so much in agreement with Blaine on so much substance that I was like, what am I gonna say? Um, so I'm gonna try to critically engage despite my great enthusiasm for the work. Um, and in so doing, I'll just raise a couple of issues about uh, the account of domination at the end. I, full disclosure, I'm writing a book on domination which aims to show that Republicans are wrong. So I've, I've got a investment in being uh, right on this one. And a couple of questions about uh, a conception-based uh, approach to political liberalism. So uh, on my reading, the heart of the book lives in Blaine's spelling out of the idea of a civic people in detail, uh, where he makes the argument that the concept of shared political autonomy is central to justifying public reason as a normative ideal for citizens in a politically liberal, well-ordered society. So that'll be the first focus of my comments. Uh, what Blaine's work draws out in my view is that there are two competing interpretations of the core commitments of political liberalism, as he said in his initial presentation. And then he guides us to his preferred interpretation. The center of the controversy between interpretation boils down to the role that respect for persons plays in the view and relatedly the role it plays in justifying public reason, if any. The reason why this matter of interpretation is significant is that two things depend upon it. One, whether the argument for justice as fairness is dispensable from political liberalism, as many think, including me, um, and how to render the argument concerning stability for the right reasons, in, in particular in the congruence argument, uh, if justice as fairness is not central to the argument. That is if some other reasonable political conception could do that work. Um, so I'm gonna to try to be briefly reconstruct the main argument so uh, as to leave myself room for substantive comments. So let's begin with the distinction Blaine makes concerning the two ways of interpret interpreting political liberalism. And this distinction of course draws on Weithman's uh, awesome book. So there's a rights-based view and a conception-based view. The first, a rights-based view sees the moral foundation of liberalism as laying in respect for persons, a la Charles Larmore, or lying in equal concern and respect for persons, for example, Dworkin. On this view, the liberal principle of legitimacy is grounded in the value of equal respect for persons and aims to give expression to that moral ideal. The moral basis for public reason on this view lies in the fact that public reasons satisfy the liberal principle of legitimacy. And again, we all know it probably by heart, including the page, uh, but according to Rawls, the liberal principle of legitimacy demands that our exercise of political power is fully proper only when it is exercised in accordance with the Constitution, the essentials of which all citizens as free and equal may reasonably be expected to endorse in light of principles and ideals acceptable to their common human reason. Rawls says that the idea of political legitimacy that is based on the idea of, pardon me, Rawls says the idea of political legitimacy is based on the criterion of reciprocity, namely that our exercise of political power is proper only when we sincerely believe that the reasons we would offer for our political actions, were we to state them as government officials, are sufficient. And we also reasonably think that other citizens might also reasonably accept those reasons. He then goes on to say, this criteria applies on two level, two levels, excuse me. One is to the constitutional structure itself, and the other is to the particular statutes and laws enacted in accordance with that structure. To be reasonable, political conceptions must justify only constitutions that satisfy this principle. So interestingly here, Rawls stopped short of saying that political conceptions of justice themselves must satisfy uh, the criterion of reciprocity, at least in that passage, but later he clarifies that they must and the idea of public reason uh, the idea of public reason revisited, that the criterion of reciprocity is a limiting feature of all reasonable political conceptions of justice. That's going to solve Chad's problem, I think. Uh, and given that they must have certain content, including basic liberties, a priority to those liberties and all purpose means for citizens to make effective use of their freedoms. Thus, the reason Larmore thinks that a principle of respect for persons must ultimately ground political liberalism and with it the conception of legitimacy and the principle of reciprocity is that arguing from the original position, which is meant to model the conditions under which free and equal persons, citizens would choose principles to govern themselves to justify the liberal principle of legitimacy or its more fundamental counterpart, 
the principle of reciprocity would be to beg the question. Thus, Larma argues that something outside justice, of, justice as fairness and political liberalism must ground the criteria of reciprocity and the liberal principle of legitimacy. And the only candidate he thinks is plausible is a principle of respect for persons. This all may seem fine and good, but if the principle of respect for persons is the moral ground of liberalism, now we need an argument justifying it. And that can't come from within political liberalism. So there's some substantive moral content outside the theory itself, which grounds the theory. Some may press that this violates the spirit of political liberalism to give a fully freestanding view. I'm less worried about that charge against Larmore's interpretation than others might be, but I'll hold commenting on that until I can specify the contrasting view, a conception-based view, and Weithman's defense of it is connected to a defense of justice as fairness. So here I'm just repeating Blaine, but according to the conception-based view, roughly the authority of the principles of justice and the liberal principles of legitimacy is contingent upon the acceptance of a particular conception of citizens and society. If we are committed to Rawls's conceptions of A, persons as free and equal citizens, and B, society as a fair system of cooperation among such, such citizens, then we have sufficient reason to employ the original position device in order to identify the correct or most reasonable principles of legitimacy and justice. But why should we accept Rawls's conception of citizens and society? Weithman suggests that we may find that as citizens of liberal democratic states, we already are committed to them, at least if we reflect seriously upon our deepest political convictions and commitments, or if not, we may find that once we see a society based on such a conception looks like a well-ordered society based on justice as fairness, for example, we become committed to them. In either case, the necessary justificatory work is done by reasonable citizens aiming to achieve reflective equilibrium with respect to their political commitments and the broader system of and their broader systems of values and belief, not by means of the identification of some external foundation for political liberalism. Now, there's one more thing to add, I think, to the conception-based view or Weithman's defense of it, at least, to show the depth of the challenge to the respect based view. And that is that Weithman has done this work to uncover an argument for the liberal principle of legitimacy from within the original position because he thinks it's necessary for the account of stability for the right reasons. In particular, he thinks the argument from the original position models, among other things, are freedom and equality. And those values are what are needed to make the congruence argument successful. And just to recall, the congruence argument is the claim that the right and the good are congruent such that each citizen has reason to incorporate the political conception of justice into their comprehensive conception and gives it overriding authority. Without the overriding this of justice, the threat of, the threat of defection looms, which would be destabilizing both to society and justice. So according to Weithman, when we fully understand the nature of the stability problem, we cannot dispense with the argument from the original position. The stability argument rests upon showing two things. One, that citizens in a well-ordered society would develop a sense of justice, and two, that they would maintain that sense of justice. The latter is known as the congruence argument, namely that citizens would incorporate a sense of justice into their lives, now comprehensive doctrines, such that they will resist opportunities to defect. In a theory of justice, the idea of Kantian autonomy as a good all citizens would come to embrace was central to the stability argument, but in political liberalism, we don't have that. So Weithman, against the dominant perspective, argues that the argument from the original position is essential to addressing the congruence aspect of stability. Okay, so now, Blaine's intervention. Blaine correctly emphasizes that Rawls' insistence that there is a family of reasonable political conceptions and clear contextual evidence that the criteria of reciprocity is a limiting feature of those conceptions suggests that Weithman's efforts, heroic as they may be, don't capture the internal commitments of political liberalism. The original position cannot do the work of justifying the criterion of reciprocity, nor can it justify the liberal principle of legitimacy. So the question looms, what justifies them and what to make of Weithman's congruence argument? Blaine prefers the conception-based view, but thinks Weithman doesn't emphasize the role of civic respect among the fundamental ideas within political liberalism. The concept of civic respect does the work of justifying the reciprocity condition, but not as an outside commitment independent of the theory. Rather, it's one of the fundamental ideas latent in democratic culture from which we work up the view of political liberalism. 
So I'm sympathetic to uh, this rendering of the view, but now Blaine has to answer the stability question, as would anyone walking this path with him. And here the concept of political autonomy is doing the work. I think Blaine could make this more explicit as a reply to the problem Weithman identifies, but now I'm gonna try to reconstruct Blaine's argument to directly access, address excuse me, the congruence problem as outlined by Weithman. Demonstrating congruence that the political conception of justice is a part of the good of citizens is central to defending the claim that justice is fairness or some other reasonable conception of justice will be stable over time. Again, the reason justice is fairness does this well, argues Weithman, is because the procedure that produces them models the freedom and equality of citizens and persons, and such freedom and equality is an integral part of all reasonable conceptions or comprehensive doctrines. Moreover, citizens' investment in their own standing as free and equal persons provides the motivational component to solve the prisoner's dilemma defection concern. So how does the idea of political autonomy do this work, Blaine's idea? Blaine gives three answers, though he doesn't frame them as directly substituting for the modeling of freedom of inequality in the original position. I think the reasons he gives can successfully do that work, though I would urge him to spell out the connection with stability more straightforwardly. Those reasons are persons, citizens will not experience alienation or estrangement from their political society. Equal political autonomy minimizes the chance for political domination. So that was one. Uh, political autonomy is the condition under which the realization of civic friendship is possible and the character of such a relationship is both intrinsically and instrumentally valuable. Of these reasons, I think the non-domination claim is the most interesting and the most persuasive as a substitute for the modeling of our freedom and equality done by the original position. Being non-dominated is both a political good and I think a good that is a condition of realizing any particular comprehensive conception of the good. Freedom and equality are necessary conditions of non domination and specifically working out a politically liberal theory of non domination is an important project in defending political liberalism, both on its own terms and in contrast to rival political theories like republicanism. Thus, by integrating a reasonable political conception of justice into their comprehensive doctrines, and in particular, the conception of political autonomy that undergirds political liberalism, congruence can be achieved. This is so because contained in the concept of political autonomy is a concept of non-domination that secures the freedom and equality of persons as citizens. Perhaps the place then to trust the account is to ask whether a political conception of non-domination is sufficient to secure the kind of freedom and equality that citizens have an interest in protecting and is sufficient to so show that justice is congruent with their good. Blaine fleshes out a conception of political non-domination in the last chapter of the book. There he adopts a political version of Republican non-domination to show that civic education within a politically liberal state can secure a political conception of freedom as non-domination. I am sympathetic to the argument, but I think that Republic, the Republican conception of freedom as non-domination is insufficient to capture some forms of domination that the political liberals should be concerned with. And thus, I think we need a broader conception of domination. Whether that broader conception can be rendered as a political conception of non-domination is an interesting question, and I might take it up, but not today. Um, so I'm just going to offer a brief critique then of the Republican concept of non-domination to show that the kinds of concerns it neglects would be of concern to political liberals like Blaine and myself. Setting aside its other features for the moment, just consider the Republic understanding of freedom is primarily concerning the hindrance of choice. However, that power is however power is exercised, um, I think there's reasons for criticizing the arbitrariness or unchecked power uh, element as well. But focusing on the hindrance of choice for a moment, much of the work of group-based social inequality, like that represented in the work of feminist and critical race theorists, illuminate the way in which dominating power, power over a capacity in Republican terms is not simply a limiting power, a hindering power, but it's a constructive one. So for example, the power of dominant groups to define group membership of subordinate groups is not about choice per se or hindering them, but about imposition of dominant norms and perspectives on subordinated groups. Consider for the example, the way in which racial groups are defined 
both for political purposes or social purposes, or the ways in which the concept woman is policed for the exclusion of trans women. This kind of power is a constructive power, and it's a controlling power both in terms of the self-understanding of group members and in terms of their freedom and equality. Yet it's not best conceived as a hindrance to choices, as social group membership is not properly conceived of in terms of choice. If a person can be dominated in this way, and I think that they can as individuals and as members of the group, then we need a broader concept of domination that reveals that domination is also a constructive power. Think Foucault there, but not fully. Uh, and so that might mean we need a broader project of civic, civic education and showing that political liberalism can accommodate a Republican conception of domination, excuse me, a Republican conception of non-domination is not sufficient to address the kinds of domination that are most troubling, especially for equality. Whether the concept of political autonomy that Blaine has defended can do this work, I'll leave to Blaine to address. I think the right rendering of recognition respect with the concept of civic respect can get us there, but I wanna hear Blaine's uh, thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now Blaine is going to give us a brief response. Right, so I'll try to spend about five minutes on, on each um, set of comments. And I just wanna thank everyone for their excellent comments and thank them more generally. I mean, I've learned a lot from their work over the years um, and I'm, it, it's, a real, it's been a real honor to, to hear their uh, reflections on this book. Um, and they all raise questions about elements in my view that I, I clearly need to think much more about. Um, so, but here's some initial uh, answers, and maybe they're wrong, may, uh, but they're definitely only partial. All right, so with regard to Micah, Micah's paper, it's kind of interesting to me that uh, given the, the, how important intentions are in my account, that I haven't, I haven't really thought about a lot of <laughs> the significance of that, um, but I intend to uh, in the future. Um, so, uh, but Micah's first set of questions concerns the role of motivation in public reason. He asks, are citizens and officials required to be motivated by public reasons when they engage in the exercise of political powers? Another way to put this question is to ask, must laws be motivated by public reason? And if so, what exactly does it mean to be motivated in this way? So here's, here's my answer, um, at least for now. Citizens and officials should intend to satisfy the duty of civility. Um, when making decisions concerning fundamental political questions. This means they, they must be committed to the sufficiency of the public reason justifications that they give for their political positions, independent of whatever additional reasons they might have for those political positions, say reasons drawn from their respective comprehensive doctrines. And here I understand sufficiency in I think the, the way that um, Micah himself proposes in his 2011 article on the sincerity of public reason uh, roughly, the idea is that the public reason justifications that citizens put forward in support of a political proposal would be ones that they, that they would find sufficient, even if they didn't have any additional uh, reasons to support that proposal, say reasons drawn from their moral and religious views. So it's kind of hypothetical, kind of factual uh, idea of, of sufficiency. Uh, thus, satisfying the duty of civility requires that citizens and officials aim at satisfying it. Uh, I, uh, I think that's inherent in the nature of the duty, just like the duty of being on it, being on it to be honest, uh, it means that you aim at telling the truth, not just that you happen to tell the truth. Um, now, this view is uh, compatible, I think, with there being laws that were pa passed in the past or, or are passed now uh, that are not in compliance with the duty of civility, but are nonetheless uh, justified um, because they can be given a, a sufficient public reason justification. So there's no requirement for a law uh, that can be justified that does have a, a sufficient public reason justification. There's no requirement for that law to be repealed simply because uh, we, we discover, uh, say, um, in the memoirs of the legislators you know, who passed it decades ago, that their real reasons were you know, religious or, comp or utilitarian or whatever. We don't need to, to revoke the law and then pass it again, but give, you know, give the public reason justification. Um, so there is a way in which laws can be passed um, in violation of the duty of civility, but nonetheless be, be uh, justified uh, in terms of public uh, reason. But laws that uh, were, but law, obviously laws that were passed um, for which there is no public reason justification or, or for which the public reason case for the repeal outweighs 
the public reason case for the retention, those obviously should, should be repealed. So I, I, so I think intentions are necessary for the duty of civility and we owe the duty of civility to one another, but there is a bit of a, um, it is still nonetheless possible to have justified legitimate laws that were not passed in a way compliant with the duty of civility. So Michael's second set of questions have, have to do with the relation between motivation, political autonomy, and political legitimacy. He writes, another question is whether the intentions and motivations of citizens are relevant at some more foundational level to the idea of political autonomy. And if the exercise of political power is legitimate only when it is consistent with political autonomy, then is our account of legitimacy sensitive in some way to intentions and motivations? So I, I, I guess um, uh, I need to unpack a few things here, which I don't do um, clearly enough in the book. Now, the intentions and motivation of citizens are definitely relevant for political autonomy. Um, specifically, to, have, to enjoy shared political autonomy, to exercise it, is just to have a certain kind of intention, to have a certain set of shared intentions, namely to be parties to a shared policy, to decide fundamental political questions by means of public reasons. Um, without this shared policy, which is a kind of an, a shared intention, citizens simply are not fully politically autonomous. They might be somewhat politically autonomous, like they have institutional autonomy, and maybe some of the, some of the decisions are justifiable to them. So they, they might have some degree of, of political autonomy, but they're not, they're not fully politically autonomous. This raises the question of what's the relation between political autonomy and political legitimacy. And so my view is that full political autonomy is sufficient for political legitimacy, but it's not always necessary. So as I mentioned earlier, there may be laws passed by officials who, um, who violate the duty of civility. That is, they, they don't think they're sufficient. They don't even think about public reasons or there's not, um, that's not part of their, their motivation. But these are kind of lucky cases, right? It just so happens, you know, that wasn't, they weren't motivated to satisfy public reason. Um, they passed the law, but it just, it's fortunate that there isn't, that they are, these laws are in fact um, justifiable in terms of public reason. So, but whereas if you, if you um, pa pass laws um, in compliance with this shared policy, that, that, that's, that, that's sufficient for uh, the legitimacy. So we should prefer the political autonomy route, obviously, as the connection between shared political autonomy and, and political legitimacy is a, is, is a necessary one, not simply a fortuitous one. And we have other reasons to want to be politically autonomous um, as well, in addition to ensuring the legitimacy of our laws, such as avoiding alienation, domination, uh, legalizing civic friendship, and so forth. So those are some quick answers to, to the set, some sets of questions that Micah raise, raises. I need to think more about them, though. I mean, I mean there might be some uh, gapping problem with them um, uh, that I'm unaware of. Now, a, a final worry that Micah raises, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it has to do with the permissibility uh, objection. And according to the permissibility obje objection, it, it has, if an action is permissible, it doesn't matter what the agent's intentions are. The agent's intentions can't affect the permissibility of the action. And I think there's a really interesting literature about it. Um, and, and, and I think maybe you know, some cases are gonna be like that with regard to public reason, like the laws that were passed like hundred years ago, they weren't passed for, on the basis of public reasons, um, but, but we now see that they do have a public reason justification and that's that they, um, they're good laws to keep or at least legitimate laws to keep. And likewise, even now we might have a legislator motivated by utilitarianism, but it just so happens that the law that is, um, turns out to be a public reason one. Um, but there are going to be counter examples um, to this. Um, and, and, but anyway, we would want to live in a society where, this, where, where it's, we, we're not so dependent on sort of contingencies like that or happy, happy um, uh, things working out happily. But, but more generally, though, I think that, Micah, you, you, I mean, you, the, your, your um, paper in this, in this wonderful collection uh, uh, does a great job of, of pointing out that the permissibility objection, all it requires is a couple of counterexamples, and you have some nice counterexamples that show that, while it might generally be true that intentions are relevant to permissibility, there are going to be some cases where they are relevant. All right, so that's a quick answer to some of the concerns that Micah raises. Uh, Lori, um, I, I'm, I'm going to jump right to the stuff about Republican freedom that, that she seizes on in the end. Uh, and uh, so Laurie is not a fan of Republican freedom, uh, at least at, at the version formulated by Philip Pettit, uh, Frank Lovett, and others. And she, her, her concern is that that uh, Repub the Re Republican conception of freedom is non-domination, and it's and it, the background conception of domination that they're working with 
is too uh, micro, uh, I guess, in, in scope or too individual focused. Like it says, can, or is an individual when deciding to X and Y, or is there some other power that can exercise arbitrary interference, right? With, with whether or not that person could do X or Y. And that doesn't really get at um, a, many important features of domination, right? To, to focus on that, on that kind of question. Now, uh, let me just say, um, right away that, that I don't mean to commit myself to the correctness of uh, Pettit's particular conception of Republican um, freedom. Uh, I just, all I mean to say in the book is that if you, if you, if you think that, Repub that, that, that Republican freedom as specified by Pettit is, is you know, important and valuable, whatever its limitations, maybe it doesn't go far enough, but if you think it's valuable, well, you get it with, with political liberalism anyway, you get it for free, so to speak. Um, so I don't mean to I don't mean to endorse Pettit's view as the complete account of uh, dominating power and and domination and and Republican freedom. Now, and I think that uh, Laurie points to a really interesting problem with the Pettit account um, and that is the constructive power of dominating groups. Um, and I think yes, uh, the answer I would have to this to this worry, which I will definitely need to think a lot more about and 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 potentially develop in future work. Is that I think political, political autonomy is the way to go in addressing these kinds of concerns. So I'm cautiously confident, or at least hopeful, that securing the conditions for all citizens to enjoy and exercise full political autonomy can go a long way to countering, ameliorating, and even perhaps eliminating uh, many instances of the kind of domination uh, that Laurie um, talks about. And this is because politically autonomous citizens can have to challenge the ways in which they previously have been categorized or defined for political purposes. That is, political autonomy provides resources and opportunities for historically oppressed groups to challenge and change the ways in which they've been defined by their dominators, it provides them, in other words, with their own constructive power. So just to illustrate this, I'll just mention a recent example, uh, ripped literally from the headlines since this came out this week, about the 2021 uh, census in Canada. So in, to better reflect all Canadians, Statistics Canada added two questions to the 2021 census. One asked a person's sex at birth, and the second question asked their gender now. And under gender, respondents were able to choose either male or female or write in the third option. And the data from the census was just released on Wednesday and it showed you know, roughly 0.33% um, of the country's population identifies a gender that differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. And um, this move by Statistics Canada was, was largely applauded by uh, the transgender community. And uh, as one advocate writes, it says something when our government is recognizing the existence of trans folks who have historically been kept out of these conversations and uncounted. But it also is useful to us to better understand how we can focus interventions and address health inequities experienced by trans folks across the country. So they know, so they know where um, they have a sense of um, where the relevant populations are concentrated as well. So I think this example is, illustrates how the exercise of political autonomy by historically marginalized groups can change the ways in which the society understands them and treats them. So Statistics Canada, I mean, did this move in response to political pressure, um, given the way in which they, they were previously asking about um, gender. So I think, I mean, the, this is just an illustration of how if you give people political autonomy, it, it enables them to, to uh, address these kind of more constructive forms of domination that Laurie is rightly concerned with. Okay, so I wanna say a few, um, I wanna say many, many, things about Chad's comments. That's why I left it to the end because I might run out of time um, since he talks about ideal theory and I have a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, but uh, so I just wanted to note though that the, 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 the problem that, that Laurie and I tried to solve with this idea of a political well or society is one that Chad himself with his uh, an excellent article that he wrote with Gauss in 20, uh, published in Ethics in 2017 points out that he does a really great job of explaining how oh, Rawls never really sorted out some of these, these issues. Um, by the end of his career. Now, uh, 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 Chad raises a couple of challenges for the idea of a political, liberal, uh, well-ordered society. Now, let me, uh, one, one, one set of challenges has to do is that, well, say we have this political, well-ordered society, right, where there's a, a number of different reasonable conceptions of justice. Can it still do the, any of the work that we, that the uh, idea of a well-ordered society did in, in a theory of justice? So let me take that, um, that was kind of his final comment, but a, let me take it first, uh, excuse me. So I think there are two different roles for ideal theory in, in Rawls's philosophy, um, which I, uh, um, one, and I take these terms, I'm gonna use some terms from Simon May's recent article on it. 
There's a deontic function that is, it has to do with the justification constraining or action constraining role. Uh, and there's a, a, what May calls a telic function that is a goal setting or political orientation role. Now the deontic function is something that Simon talks about in his paper. I think Anthony Layden emphasizes it in his response to Mark Sen. But most of the literature focuses on the telic function, right? the goal setting orientation uh, function. That's, that's the subject of uh, John Sim Simmons' famous article and it's the conception that's been criticized by Sen and Gauss. Now, I think the view that I developed in chapter three of the book actually has elements of both, but I don't clearly distinguish them or talk about them in the book because it only occurred to me that it has elements of both after I read Simon's article and that was much, uh, after I'd finished writing the book and I was there's no way I was gonna go back to it. Um, so uh, I think the deontic function is un, unaffected by the worries of the, that Chad raises about the political, liberal, well-ordered society. Um, just because it doesn't really, um, it's not something we're aiming at, right? Uh, with the deontic function, it constrains the kinds of justifications we can give. And I kind of gesture at this idea in the book on, on page 37 in, in note 72. It says that the idea of the just well-ordered society that is in the theory, in, in, as in the theory of justice, even if unrealizable, could act as a kind of regulative ideal for citizens by requiring that they act only on those principles that would be realized in such a society. Hence, orienting one's actual political activities with reference to the idea of the well-ordered society might be required by a principle of mutual respect. So end of quote. So, so there might be that, I mean, maybe I can save the idea of even the theory of justice version of well-ordered society if I just stick with the deontic view. But I don't think we need to give up entirely on the, on the telic function. And I think it might be helpful here to, do, to draw another distinction, which I don't, again, don't do in the book. I mean, I really am grateful to Chad for forcing you to, to think these things through. So that we can understand, first of all, a well-ordered society is a fully legitimate society because whatever conception of justice is realized in the basic structure or a mix of conceptions, they're gonna, it's gonna be a reasonable conception, right? And so it's gonna be able to elicit the free compliance and support of, of all reasonable citizens. But it's still possible for a well-ordered society to be a fully just society. Say we're, given a particular conception of justice. So say I'm committed to justice as fairness. Well, I don't need to say that I am. I am committed to justice as fairness. Um, and say the justice as fairness political party wins a parliament, is a majority in the House of Commons, uh, wins multiple majorities, it's a very successful government, so it's re-elected three times. And it passes a number of laws and it basically fully realizes justice as fairness, right? Nothing in the idea of a political liberal will order society rules that out. And so, Thinking about that scenario might still help me think about what would society be like if, if justice as fairness as one of a family of, of reasonable conceptions was, was um, successful and, 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 and fully realized. And so that might help me um, evaluate um, that conception, compare it to others. It might help orient my political activities and might provide me with goals and so forth. So it can, it can, do, all, it can do a lot of the same, same functions now, um, Chad mentions this really about stability, though. I mean, one of the one of the big points of the well or society in Rawls is that we we say we realize justice as fairness. Is it stable? Well, that's an open question whether or not um, it, it's going to be stable or not, right? Or features of it will be stable. So it could be that um, uh, we might think that well, if I, if we actually won this parliamentary uh, uh, majority, implemented justice as fairness, it might be really popular. People might revise their views about justice and come to endorse endorse it and, and 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 there's nothing within human nature that that rules that out i mean of course there might be disputes about how to realize certain certain elements that, that chan notes but but i think that um, realizing a concept conception of justice might change people's perceptions of it and and i'm sorry to keep uh, talking about canada i don't know well here i'm apologizing it's the ultimate canadian thing to do um but but here's some 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 examples, right? Like before before public health care became part of you know what, what we might call a constitutional essential in Canada. I mean it was it was debated. Like there are political parties very much opposed to it. I mean the Conservative Party was opposed to it. It's passed, and now for as long as I've lived, I can't think of any political party that would run on a, on a platform opposing public health care. I mean they, they they want they want to reform it or revise it. Or it, it needs to be fixed. It's not perfect for sure. But, but, but no political party would have as, as a plank of its platform, get rid of it, right? Same thing for same-sex marriage, since it's been, um, been become uh, law in uh, 20, 2005. Uh, it's just not on the agenda anymore, right? Everyone, uh, you know, in term, at least in terms of the uh, groups competing for political power. And the current example right now is uh, $10 date 
childcare, right? This is a policy that the liberal government is implementing in cooperation with the provinces. That is, it'll make childcare available to everyone for $10 a day um, throughout Canada. Now, um, although it might be $12 now with inflation uh, being a problem. Now, you know, in the last election, last fall, the Tories, the Conservatives opposed it, you know, understandably so. But I, I will gladly bet a very large sum of money that they will not be opposing it four years from now, once it's in place. Um, so I, so this is just speculation on my part, but I think that once, once you have, if you have a political conception of justice that you think is attractive and compelling and, and, and um, capable of generating support, then once it's actually realized, it might change the, the, the range of conceptions that, that people um, endorse. That's, I mean, that is highly speculative, obviously, but that's sort of um, a, a first stab at attempting to, to reply to Chad. And I just, indulge me for one moment, I just have one more thing to say, um, getting to uh, institutional matters. Now, uh, I do think there is, so to Chad's challenge that, 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 that I might be understating the diversity of reasonable political conceptions of justice. Well, let's think about um, two very different conceptions. So William Edmondson's socialist interpretation of justice and fairness, say there's a socialist view, um, and then, and then uh, John Tomasi's free market fairness, right? And so you have these two very, very different views, um, but they're both would be categorized by political liberalism as reasonable political conceptions of justice. They, they're political conceptions, they satisfy the three conditions and so forth. There is gonna be a fair amount of overlap in terms of the core basic rights that they think should be protected constitutionally, right? They do agree on, on a lot there. Um, they're, they're both committed to you know, democratic procedures and so forth. Um, now they disagree about um, some things that should that, it, that might be part of the constitution. So, so Edmondson thinks that um, public ownership of the commanding heights of the economy should be constitutionalized. Tomasi thinks that free market rights should be constitutionalized. I guess my, my response to that kind of dispute is to don't constitutionalize either. <laughs> you know, don't. And, and in general, when you have disagreements about justice, um, don't talk about constitu constitutionalizing things, right? Uh, and I, I, I think that. Um, uh, I, I mean, this is again, totally speculative on my part, but I guess I'm, I'm in favor of sort of this uh, relying more on, on democracy. And if something is popular, if you have a policy, like, I mean, just go back to the Canadian healthcare example, that a law not, not a, um, uh, uh, that, that is so pop wide, gains such widespread support, it's, it becomes a de facto constitutional essential, even though it's not formally part of the legal constitution, right? And that I think is the way to go. So don't constitution, constitutionalize fair free market liberties, don't constitutionalize public ownership. Try them if you get elected and see what happens. And, and, and if they don't work out, then, then uh, um, see if something else works better. But, um, but that's, that would be my recommendation for accommodating that, that kind of the disagreement um, over uh, among reason, uh, adherence to different reasonable conceptions of justice. Okay, sorry for talking so long, but those are such wonderful comments. I had a lot to say. The floor is now open. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can use the Q&A box or the chat and I will do my best. Emil? Yes, hi, do, do you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. Um, thanks a lot for uh, everyone, first of all, for this. Uh, stimulating discussion has been great to follow us here. And thanks, uh, Blaine, in particular, of course, for this excellent book. Uh, I read it and uh, I agree with, with a lot of it. But I also have a lot of questions and uh, I would like to ask two at least here. I'll try to be brief. So the first question is about autonomy as the justification, and the second about to whom public reasons are addressed. Uh, so the first, is um, a main claim in the book is that the ideal of full political autonomy justifies the main elements of political liberalism and its idea of public reason. But what I wonder is whether it's really autonomy as such that serves as the main or perhaps the most fundamental justification here in your case. Uh, and perhaps whether in what sense your justification really differs from, for instance, the, the one provided by Weissman in his book. Uh, so, because what you refer to as justificatory autonomy is something that is realized when fundamental political decisions are made using reasons that citizens find acceptable, qua reasonable citizens. 
And that is a kind of autonomy that is not merely realized by citizens when they find the reasons in favor of political actions acceptable. Because I mean, if it were, then it would also be realized in a society where political actions are justified by a comprehensive view, at least for those who happen to share that view. A Christian majority, for instance, could then achieve justificatory autonomy among themselves, at least, when they pose their view on the minority. And I guess you wouldn't accept that, right? So in order to yield a justification for public reason, it's necessary that the reasons are of particular kind. They have to be acceptable to all as free and equal, as reasonable persons. And as we also put it then, that they have, would have to be derived from fair terms of cooperation that all persons would give to themselves when fairly represented as free and equal persons. And that brings me to my worry here that if the content of this conception of justificatory autonomy is given by this conception of citizens as free and equal, is it not the case then that this account of autonomy is, so to speak, completely dependent on this underlying conception of persons or citizens as free and equal? And is it then not the case that it is this conception that is the most fundamental justification here, with autonomy being a part of this larger justification, perhaps serving perhaps a very important part which you demonstrate in your book. But perhaps that justification is still dependent in a fundamental way on this conception. So I wonder if you would agree with that or if that is a, if that is a correct interpretation of, of your view or, or not. And, and then the, the second um, question is about, about to whom public reasons are addressed. And that concerns that the, you state that um, the justificatory constituency the citizens to whom public reasons are addressed are reasonable citizens. And I take it that that means that public reasons are not addressed to those who are unreasonable. And that is, of course, a quite common view in the debate. It's also advocated by Kuang, for instance, and others. Um, but I think I might be in a min minority where I find that view a bit strange, actually, a bit difficult to reconcile with, with the Rosen, Rosen ideas. And in particular, I find it a bit hard to reconcile it with the rules and view on the freedom and equality of persons. Because on that view, persons are free and equal in virtue of possessing, as you know, the two moral powers, the two capacities up to a certain degree. And of course, also unreasonable people, presumably most of the unreasonable people, will also have these two capacities. So they will also be free and equal. They will possess this fundamental moral status, just as the reasonable ones are. And should we not then treat all citizens, the reasonable and the unreasonable alike, as free and equal persons by justifying our actions to them, to all citizens who possess this fundamental moral status? And then, of course, the unreasonable persons may not accept the reasons we provide, but we might, it seems, nevertheless address our justifications to them, thereby honoring their status as free and equal by providing them with reasons that they of course will not accept, but which they might reasonably be expected to accept, as Ross puts it in political liberalism. So I wonder if you find that suggestion, I mean, incompatible with your view, if it's um, really important that public reasons are only addressed to the reasonable, or if you would be willing to accept that kind of view where we actually address the unreasonable as well. Thank you. Right, so th thanks for those excellent uh, questions. I'll take them uh, in order. So, um, yeah, so I see um, the ideal of political autonomy as, um, as part of the overall conception of citizens as free and equal. So I don't, uh, it, it, my, so I don't, I, I don't really disagree with, with uh, um, Weithman on this point that, um, uh, um, in that uh, I see it more as a spelling out of what, what it is to be a free and equal citizen um, is, is to be a politically autonomous citizen. Um, so I, I'm happy to, to, to say that, that, that yes, the conception of citizens of which autonomy is an essential um, element um, that is doing the justificatory work. Now, um, I do think that the uh, idea of autonomy goes beyond um, that, that I defend in the, in the, in, in the book goes beyond uh, 
uh, sort of justifi justificatory autonomy and that it has a kind of shared autonomy quality. And that's why, so you, you raise the case of, well, you can imagine I, I, a society in which um, laws are passed in accordance with a comprehensive doctrine and maybe the majority of people adhere to that comprehensive doctrine. So at least the majority of people enjoy justificatory autonomy uh, as, um, and, you know, and uh, that might be, the the case, but they don't have shared autonomy, obviously, because they can't share in in sovereignty with uh, the people who don't adhere to um, the the dominant comprehensive doctrine. So I think the idea. Uh, I sometimes in an earlier draft, um, I was asked, well, what does shared autonomy add? And I think it does add. It adds this. It's, it's motivated by kind of the conception of mutual respect, and I think it, it adds um, that uh, the, the the this. Uh, important element to the justification for um, mutually acceptable public reasons. Uh, so, but, but you know, overall, the, the overall thrust of your first question, I, I, I think um, I'm happy to take on board. I, I think I uh, agree that it, part of the conception-based view that I'm, I'm advancing, I'm, I mean it as a, you know, in many respects, an amended version of uh, Paul Weichmann's account. Although I wish, I saw he was here earlier. Um, he's not here now though, so I can't ask him to, to verify if that's the case. Um, regarding the, the, so let me know if, you, if, if I fail to answer that, but um, regarding the second, uh, your second question. Yeah, so I was, I've been pressed on this before um, and by someone who also has just left no, um, the, the, uh, the group who, uh, he was here earlier, RJ Leland asked me um, on an earlier version of this um, account to, to whom is the, our public reasons addressed. And I do want to emphasize that they are addressed to unreasonable citizens too, right? Yeah, so um, the public reason justifications are addressed to all citizens, definitely. And I, so, but I, but I don't think that the success or failure of the justification um, can, can hinge on the, accept, the acceptability of these, these reasons um, for unreasonable citizens, right? So, so I give, I mean, I, I give the uh, comprehensive liberals and the religious fundamentalists and, and, and so forth, I give them public reasons for, for my position. There are reasons that in principle do not, you know, um, are freestanding, so there's nothing stopping them from, from taking them on, on board, um, but I don't expect them to accept them, right? Or, or I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I, I have no surprise when they reject them. Whereas um, with, with, I am committed to the acceptability of the justifications I give with respect to, to other reasonable citizens. Um, so I, I, I want to, yeah, I should emphasize that more. I think um, in response to RJ, I quickly, right before this went to, the book was finalized, I think I inserted a footnote uh, saying, oh, oh yes, uh, unreasonable citizens too. Um, but yeah, so I want to emphasize that. Another thing, but though, just your question re reminds me that was something I wanted to mention is that on, on my view, um, I don't see reasonableness as a either or kind of state of being, right? That either you're a reasonable citizen or you're unreasonable. I think um, reasonableness is a matter of degree, right? Um, and you might have someone who is um, reasonable about most issues. Uh, and in, that, in, the, in the Rawlsian sense, right? Um, it, you know, is willing to, to decide most fundamental issues in terms of public reasons, is committed to the duty of civility. But there might be one or two or issues that for which, because of the nature of the issue, they just can't bring themselves, right, to, to, to bracket their comprehensive doctrines. And that, that's unfortunate, like it's a violation of the duty of civility in those cases. Um, but I don't think that that disqualifies that person from being a, a member of the constituency of a, the justificatory constituency if they're if they're capable of being reasonable with respect to you know 98 out of 100 issues, right? Um, and so I think when people raise these hard cases for public reason views, like you know, abortion, is sort of a classic case, and maybe um, physician-assisted suicide, I think well, okay, there might be these particular cases where some people committed to certain comprehensive doctrines just can't can't fulfill the duty of civility, but that doesn't mean we condemn them to being unreasonable across the board, right? They might be perfectly capable of thinking in terms of public reasons and committed to it on, on, all, on, on most constitutional essentials. And, 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 and so I have, I think we need a more kind of fine-grained understanding of reasonableness. And likewise, even amongst the unreasonable, I think there's a big difference between, um, that I do talk about this in the book, between unreasonable citizens who are committed to liberalism, right, comprehensive liberals, and unreasonable citizens who reject liberalism, right? And I think the way in which we interact 
for those two groups of unreasonable citizens um, will have to differ, um, should differ. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot, there's a lot of more fine-grained distinctions that should be made when thinking about the unreasonable. Um, and and so I, I would I, I I don't really I don't follow Fong or at least um, uh, based on my quick memory of of his position, um, in, in just not in just ignoring the unreasonable altogether. That's not my that's not my, my view. Alex is next. Hi, can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Great. Well, thanks, Blaine, and thanks, everyone uh, in the panel uh, for this really great discussion. Um, I thought this was really cool, and it's got the gears turning. And I, I wanted to talk about uh, one part uh, of your of your presentation, Blaine, near the start, where you talked about the kind of motivation for political autonomy. And I, I quite like, I know Lori focused on the domination stuff, but I quite like the alienation uh, discussion. I thought that, I, you know, I was convinced that there's one respect in which your, your conception of full political autonomy can uh, guard against alienation, because I think uh, one way to be alienated is, is to be treated in a way that doesn't, uh, by a state that doesn't satisfy institutional autonomy. Uh, but I, I thought, you know, it's, it's possible that uh, some of your views might also be a source of alienation, or elements of your view might be a source of alienation for citizens as well. Uh, so I was thinking that your conception of justificatory autonomy uh, can lead to the alienation of citizens, and it can do so, I think, if you're if you have a case of a citizen who, by and large, might be committed to you know this kind of mostly reasonable person that you just discussed, committed to abiding by public reasons, but who nevertheless has a controversial, comprehensive conception that has elements that don't have like reasonable proxies in public reasons, right? Where I can't just say here's a sufficient reason for uh, that satisfies the counterfactual test you laid out earlier, right? So I give some examples of, of, of views that I take to be pretty clearly reasonable that I want to admit into public justification, but that might suffer from a kind of alienation if they're forced to trade exclusively in shared public reasons, right? So one I think is uh, Du Bois' view of collective black identity and how that's necessary for the liberation of black Americans, right? Uh, for him, there's a really, it's a really comprehensive view of collective agency and race that I don't think is shared very widely many people and, and to think about and of course this leads to a commitment that, that has a lot, a lot of overlap with public reason right it's committed to commit this kind of equal liberal democratic project and the promotion of the liberation of all citizens but at the same time it commits this kind of comprehensive group identity that i think if you cut from the view it it, it cuts a lot of the important stuff that, that Du Bois has a deep commitment to. Another view that I think is, is Rawls's favorite example uh, is Martin Luther King's you know, religious view where I think there's just no way to take the religion out of this without taking something substantive that Martin Luther King identifies with, right? I think in, in the letter from Birmingham City Jail, for instance, he's basically saying that acting for the liberation of people is, is a kind of worship for him. Uh, and I take it that uh, why, why someone with this kind of view would be alienated uh, from participating in uh, uh, in public justification according to your condition of, of justitory autonomy. Well, it would be kind of like, it would feel like play acting where I have to go onto this political stage and act out in accordance with these rules, a lot of which I can agree with. So I might, I might be happy to take on that role, but I can't really feel like a participant in political society when I'm doing that. I still have to feel like I'm putting on like a public face or I have to participate with these external standards I can't really identify with. Uh, I take it that could be a source of alienation for citizens that they're made to exclude these kinds of background comprehensive conceptions. Uh, I am operating on this assumption that they can't map on to all the public reasons. There's gonna be elements of this that you that you can't adequately just have like proxy uh, public reasons for. So I, I guess my worry then was just that, that uh, while you might guard against alienation from, from one kind of source, uh, some of the conditions you rely on might themselves be a source of alienation in a diverse society. Right, so thanks very much for that uh, question, um, Alex. So, yeah, um, a couple of things to say about that. Um, obviously, so my view uh, is, I mean, I adhere, this is one of my very few disagreements with uh, Lori and Christie is that I adhere to kind of a, the wide view of public reason. And that I, I think it's fine for um, citizens to introduce reasons drawn from their comprehensive doctrines um, so long as they satisfy what you know, Rawls calls the proviso, so long as there are sufficient um, public reasons given ultimately for the political positions that they take. And so, I mean, Rawls, as you know, uses the uh, Martin Luther King example himself to illustrate the proviso. Um, so you, King's uh, arguments, you know, they, they're religious in nature, they appeal to God, 
but but there's also a public reason justification for everything that he's he's fighting for. Now, might he feel alienated by that? Well, I mean, I'm not I'm not a, a scholar of the writings of Martin Luther King, but I do re recall that he was asked once, like, what you know, in response to a lot of these religious his religious rhetoric, what would you say to someone who you know doesn't believe in God? Why should they be moved? And I I can't reconstruct the exact words of what he says, but he gives a sincere reply. So like he's not appealing to, um, he doesn't appeal to religion in the answer. He, he says, well, okay, yeah, there's people who, are, who don't believe in God and his, but they should still, um, you know, uh, fight for the, um, fight for civil rights, fight for the end of racial segregation and discrimination. And here is this, and he, and he basically gives a public reason argument to them. Um, so I don't know. I mean, looking at that particular case, I mean, I'm not. Was, was he? What, did he feel alienated that he was asked to do that? Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, may, maybe not. But, but I guess in that case, I think well, whatever mild alienation he might feel, I mean, nothing's stopping him from continuing to express the religious views and religious justifications that he has. Um, but, but it seems like a relatively minor kind of uh, alienation. Um, rel um, uh, relative to to um, uh, other other kind, I mean, uh, feeling like um, other kinds of alienation that that, that I try to address uh, with the view, and and so maybe so I don't mean to so maybe there are maybe the, my view does entail certain forms of alienation. Maybe you can't have it all, right? Maybe maybe no matter what in this imperfect world, um, some people and especially a diverse world, some people will uh, some even reasonable people, just people will will feel some degree of alienation. So I guess maybe on what I'm saying is my, my view minimizes it as much as is is humanly possible. Um, I mean, like I, I feel alienated that many of my personal tastes aren't aren't more widely shared, right? I don't know what's wrong with people. Um, but uh, uh, but but you know that's um, that's just that, that's just the nature of the world. Um, so so uh, uh, so, so I guess so, so. One way to address, so to address the concern is having this kind of wide view of public reason, which lets people express these views that they hold, that they sincerely hold. And and then if, if they're asked for the public reason justification, sometimes they can give it, like as Martin Luther King did to when he was asked, like, what, what do you say to the to the non-Christian or to the non-religious person? Um, maybe they feel a bit of alienation in doing that. Um, I don't know. Um, and then there might be some cases though that that they can't they can't give um, a, a non a public reason justification. And then I would just appeal to my my early what I said earlier that well maybe it's a matter of degree right maybe um, uh, not everyone um, uh, can be fully reasonable all the time uh, and and it might be if it, if it's so if you if if giving a public reason justification for your position regarding X would alienate you um, maybe when it comes to that you can't be you know in this technical sense reasonable right um, and. That, that's just the way it is. I mean, if you're reasonable most of the time, then then, uh, th then maybe that's not too much of a worry. But um, so so I, I guess that's a, a, a my attempt to to respond to that. So I think we have time for one more question, and Baldwin is next. Hi, excuse me, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Okay, thanks, Brian, for your very brilliant books. Yeah, and also thanks, uh, I mean, thanks, Michael, Chuck, and Nori for your really good comment. I, learned, I mean, I learned a lot from them. Um, I mean, uh, actually, I agree uh, nearly all of the things uh, in Brian's book, but I just wonder, uh, it seems that in your theory, you assume that there is a fixed access uh, I, I mean, there's a fixed set of public reason, uh, but it's not the case in many, uh, I mean, in many real societies that the boundaries of public reasons continue changing. Uh, say, for example, sometimes some people uh, thought some uh, reasons are widely shared, but when some laws or policies are justified by that reason, then it's so controversial that in a sense that people find that well we can't i mean we uh, we can't endorse that reason we can't endorse that value or maybe sometimes some people raise some controversial ideas but then people start to think that well that's great we should widely share it so i mean that if 
the boundaries of public reasons are quite unstable, then would it be the case that it's quite hard to identify whether uh, each other are really sharing some kind of policies? Say, for example, sometimes some members may uh, decide political questions on the grounds of uh, reasons uh, that he thought is a public reason, but then people thought, that, well, no, it's not. Or maybe uh, sometimes they raise some uh, law proposal that seemed to be quite controversial, but then people thought, well, it may be great. I mean that in this case, there may be misunderstandings among people on whether each other really share that policy and then may cause the breakdown of that civic people. Uh, so that's why I'm wondering whether, uh, I mean, uh, your, I mean, whether your theory would, I mean, how your theory would address this kind of possible misunderstanding or conflict among members uh, in that civic people. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for that uh, question, Baldwin, and uh, nice to um, hear from you. Um, I should mention that Baldwin was kind enough to read a penultimate version of the book and gave some extremely helpful comments on it. On it, so so I'd like to thank him for those comments. Um, and I also want to thank him for joining us, since I think it's probably two or three o'clock in the morning um, where he is. Uh, so um, yeah, so public, you're totally right. The public reasons change over time. Conceptions of justice will change over time, and um, so I. I, I Maybe, maybe it's just a, a kind of um, an artifice of how you present the idea that you sort of present, here's, here's, a, here's the menu of public reasons that you can select from, or here's the menu of reasonable political conceptions of justice that are um, available um, in, the, uh, in, in the political society. But, but of course, things aren't static, right? So thing, things evolve over time. Uh, things that were previously considered public reason uh, you know, say, say widely shared or mutually acceptable forms of reasoning become less so over time and maybe other, other forms of reasoning, you know, emerge. Um, I'm totally, I mean, that, that has to be part of any public reason view for sure. And I guess, I mean, my way to accommodate that, you know, you have free, you have free um, political institutions, people can debate things in the, not only in the public political forum, to use a term of art, but in, in the background culture. Um, People advance views about um, certain issues, uh, and they give, you know, and, and that changes the content of a public reason and people thinking about what can be publicly justified. Uh, and, and you know, so I think like the the way in which same sex marriage has come to be viewed over the last thirty years or so provides a, a an excellent example of that. I mean, I think when I, you know, when I was um, a young man, nineteen ninety. Um, the idea that, you know, like the law, laws understood of marriage is between a man and a woman, and that seemed relatively uncontroversial, and, and now it was publicly justified, and that seemed all very straightforward. And then, um, but, but uh, you know, 30 years later, that's, that it seems, no, it seems obviously discriminatory and, and unjust. And public reasoning about it has, has led to, um, what I interpret as public reasoning about that, about that topic, has led to... Um, a very different view about the nature of marriage and what can be publicly justified in terms of marriage. So yeah, so I don't I, I apologize if my um, my my presentation implied that you know the the set of public reasons is sort of fixed you know, and and immutable. And likewise, even with the reasonable to get back at Chad's point, I mean, about well, the reasonable political conceptions of justice, those will change. I mean, I think those will probably cha change or can change over time. You know, um, and and and. Um, they can give rise to new public reasons. Things that were pre previously regarded as public reasons might now be seen to be uh, not, um, it's a fact, uh, and so forth. So yeah, so I, I apologize for my presentation uh, uh, um, if, if, I, if I imply that it would not be the case. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I wanted to thank the PPE Society for hosting us and Corey Hensel in particular for all her hard work. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to Blaine for writing this excellent book and to Chad and Micah and Lori for giving fantastic comments and to all the attendees. 
uh, who were here today. Yes, thanks everyone, I really appreciate it. I owe you all, I don't know, beer, coffee, whiskey, um, your, your choice. Thank you.